I don't do a lot of speaking uh, here in Chicago. I know there are countless opportunities to do so. Um, and it's not because I don't uh, love meeting with entrepreneurs and helping. It's because I travel a lot and I like to save my evenings uh, for my family. But um, IMSA has a very special place in my life. Um, I was thinking uh, earlier today that there's not a lot of um, places, a lot of institutions or people that I would give credit um, for that if, I, if they hadn't been around, I wouldn't be where I am today. And IMSA is one of those. Um, and so it, it's a real pleasure for me to get to give this talk um, as part of the IMSA program. Um, those of you who know me, I'm pretty informal, lighthearted, so I'll try to make this funny. My wife tells me that most of my jokes aren't funny, so you'll have to bear with me when I laugh at my own jokes. You can laugh with me if you like, but you don't have to. Um, so when IMSA first approached me to do this talk, uh, I think it was in the fall, um, I was like, you know, I, I really don't have a hard time giving my evenings. I really don't want to do this. And they were like, February 25th is so far away. <laughs> don't worry about it. Let's just lock it in the calendar. It seemed like so innocuous at the time. I was like, okay, great. Lock it in the calendar February 25th. And then they kept emailing me, like, well, what are you going to talk about? And I was like, oh, I don't know. And I would like, not respond to emails. And everyone's like, getting really frustrated with me, I'm sure. Like, God, why won't you respond? So I was, I was at a fundraiser, uh, an IMSA, that was, it wasn't really a fundraiser, an IMSA event last month. And um, they cornered me. Three, three different IMSA people were like, okay, you are not leaving this building until you tell us what you're talking about. And so I was talking with another IMSA alum, and I was like, just about entrepreneurship in general. And he was like, uh, was like entrepreneurship is so irrational. And I was like, that's it. I'm going to talk about irrational entrepreneurship. <laughs> I was like, that's sufficiently broad that I'll be able to really talk about anything I want, and it'll fall under the topic of irrational entrepreneurship. <laughs> so I was like, OK, great. So I was all set. And, um, and like, like I did at IMSA, I prepared for this you know, in a few nights in advance, maybe last night. Um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> maybe earlier today, unclear. Um, so I was like, OK, so this is, this is going to be good stuff. So I was like. Certainly, someone else has thought about irrational entrepreneurship before. I'm going to prep for class by going online um, and searching for irrational entrepreneurship. <laughs> Sadly, it turns out the expert on irrational entrepreneurship <laughs> is me. So I was like, this is like the most sad thing that happened to me all week. So I was like, oh, crap. I have no, I'm starting with nothing. <laughs> um, OK. So um, I didn't make this up either. It's like actually, actually it. OK. So I was like, well, what, what do I really want to talk about here? So I was like, well, I should actually say something about irrational entrepreneurship since I did actually say I would talk about that. So my, my talk is in four parts. Um, I'll start with doing a little bit of talk about entrepreneurship and why it is so crazy that we do this. And um, there's a couple of videos that I'll play uh, that will just help you, I think, give some thought to um, what draws people to spend their lives on these, on these crazy pursuits of starting companies. Um, the, uh, the second is I wanted to sort of tell my story, especially for the IMSA students who are here, but I didn't want to just, but I also wanted to give tips. Um, and I didn't want to just go through a laundry list of like, here's what I did when I was 1999 and to go through the whole thing. And I didn't want to also just be like, here's my list of tips. So what I decided to do is sort of um, go through my, entre my last 13 years of being an entrepreneur um, and highlight sort of mistakes I made Mostly mistakes, a couple things I did right. But mostly mistakes I made throughout the way. There's a lot more of those to choose from. And basically turn sort of my story, uh, tell you my story through the lens of things that I've learned. And that hopefully will be some tips for you guys. Um, since this is a great minds talk, I decided I would give you some insights on humanity. It seems like a thing to do when you're here. And then when all that fails, as it, un as it undoubtedly will, I'll give you some dating tips. Um, <laughs> I, I expect the kids at IMSA will, will, uh, will appreciate that. Um, OK. So there we go. Um, we'll take Q&A at the end, but I'll try to blow through this uh, as quickly as I can. Um, so I've made the claim that entrepreneurship is irrational. Um, I think it is. Um, and, but I've also said it's necessary. So I want to I try to make that argument that it is critical to our economy uh, and to our culture. So uh, after my Google search left me hanging, I started to think about the very word. So let's, uh, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. OK, fine. Um, here we go. So does anyone know where the word? Uh, Entrepreneur comes from? Brand. Well, thanks. <laughs> Fine. Do you know what it means? I took French at IMSA, OK? So I know. I know two words, basically. Um, um, so so let's, let's actually look at this. Um, to undertake or to begin. So it is all, it is all about um, the beginning, which I think is, is, is kind of obvious. 
Um, so who first you, okay, so you seem to know a lot. Um, who first coined the term entrepreneurship? Oh, we're, we're out of ideas. That was quick. That was quick. Okay. Um, so here he is. Nice looking guy. Um, he is Richard Cantillon. I might say Cantillon, but Cantillon. And this is his essay. Um, and basically, um, since I started SparkNotes, I was able to just find a SparkNote on this. And it turns out, um, I did not read the uh, essay on the nature of commerce in general. Um, it turns out he divides the world into um, fixed wage earners and non-fixed wage earners. Um, and he says, uh, entrepreneurs, quote, are non-fixed income earners who pay known costs of production but earn uncertain incomes. Okay? And then he adds, quote, due to the speculative nature of pandering to an unknown demand for their product. And you may be thinking, okay, well, that's boring. Um, but this dude seems to have hit on two concepts, burn rate, these are the known costs of production. Anyone who started a company knows that the burn rate is key. Um, and this, this pandering he talks about is really product market fit. This pandering for an unknown demand for their product. So in, his, in the very first essay ever written about entrepreneurship, the two things that he focused on were burn rate and product market fit. And here we are 400 years later, 300 years later, um, and we're still dealing with those same issues. What was, but what he got wrong was he did not look as on, he did not consider entrepreneurs to be disruptive at all. Um, in fact, he says that um, entrepreneurs bring equilibrium to a market by correctly predicting consumer preferences, which is kind of nice. But he basically treats us like futures traders, like these you know start, like companies are pork bellies, um, and as long as you're sort of trading at the right price, that's really all the value we add. So that's uh, that's him. So the next guy who says anything interesting about entrepreneurship happens a couple years later, a couple hundred years later. What's wrong with these people? They don't really look very attractive. Um, this is Joseph Schumpeter. Um, he coined the term creative destruction, which I think a lot of people have just kind of become very popular recently as sort of describing what entrepreneurs do. Um, and where he differed, what he really brought to the table um, was that we are disruptive. Um, but more than that, he proposed that the entire basis of capitalism is entrepreneurship. And I'll, I'll read it. It's a somewhat lengthy quote, but I, I really liked it. The fundamental impulse that sets and keeps the capitalist engine in motion comes from the new consumer's goods, the new methods of production and transportation, the new markets, and the new forms of industrial organization that capitalist enterprise creates. The opening up of new markets, foreign or domestic, and the organizational development from the craft shop and factory to such concerns as U.S. Steel illustrate the same process of industrial mutation that incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within, incessantly destroying the old one, incessantly creating a new one. So to the extent that you look at capitalism as the driving force of our country and largely of the world, he basically says that without it, you have a static economy that never changes. Um, so much for trading pork bellies, right? Um, our entire nation is built on this. So why is this all irrational? Um, well, the only thing that's irrational about this, because this all makes sense so far, right? This is all great. We need it. The only thing that really turns out to be super irrational um, is that some of the most talented people in the country and in the world devote their lives to it with very little economic return in almost all cases. Um, now, there are two. I'm a, I'm a math major. Um, so there are two things that I think people often confuse that I just want to engage with you guys on. And that's um, risk and uncertainty. So the, too, many, too many entrepreneurs I know, even too many investors I know, constantly use these terms interchangeably, but they're not. And they're not in an important way. Um, this is the definition of risk in an economic sense. Mitigating risk is what insurance companies do. You can imagine a bunch of actuaries sitting around a table and trying to predict the likelihood of really unlikely things happening. Uncertainty is totally different. Uh, this is what Cantillon referred to as this, you know, that speculative nature of pandering to an unknown demand for their product. It's impossible when you have a new thing that no one's ever done before, trying to estimate the value or the likelihood of that thing being a thing is too hard. We can't do it. Um, and so when you combine, oh, uh -huh. 
video interlude. Now, if this works, Christy gets a lot of credit here. Let's see. The, the kids in the room might not know who this is, but that's okay. There are reports that there is no evidence of a direct link between Baghdad and some of these terrorist organizations. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. Excuse me, but is this an unknown unknown? <laughs> Uh, I'm not several unknowns. I'm just wondering if it's an unknown. Mr. Chair, if you're not here, I'm right here. Okay, so um, who knew? Who knew that he was so smart about startups? Um, so, okay, so hold on. Let me try to figure this out here. So the known, the known unknowns are risks. The unknown unknowns are uncertainties. Okay? And I think that is a really, really important thing to understand. And when you are starting your own company, it's really critical to think and understand, what are the things I know I don't know? And what are the things I don't know I don't know? And being able to divide those things is really, really critical. And we think about them differently. They have different, they have different ways of, of, of being addressed and mitigated. And you should get, you get different credit for them in the economy. So the challenge is um, that our known unknowns are usually very long risks. Right? So we know what we're about to do is really hard. But we also operate in high uncertainty. So the things we know we don't know are bad, and the things we don't know we don't know are bad. And Operationally, good entrepreneurs separate those two. They may not think about it in the same way, but they know that, okay, here's the stuff that I know is tough, and here's the stuff that I, that I don't know. Um, but where the market, I think, really breaks down is, is when you put those two things together. High risk on its own is easy. That's insurance. High uncertainty on its own, okay, if I don't have a lot of risk. But when you multiply the two together, they compound in a way that makes it very, very difficult to reward the entrepreneurs appropriately for the risk they take, the uncertainty they face, and the value they create. Now, I don't know if there are any VCs here. I don't see any of my friendly VCs in the room. Turns out they have a much better deal. Um, they have portfolios to pool risk. Okay, so they, can, they basically can take the risk right off the table. Um, and the way they make their money is betting on uncertainty. And, what, and they're very best, the best VCs out there are people who will basically make a bet on the way some uncertainty is going to play out, whether it's mobile or whether it's social or whether it's international or whatever the case may be. They basically say, we're all in on this view of the world. And then they mitigate their risk by betting on 10 different companies that are all in that same space. It doesn't matter which one of the 10 companies ends up being the right one. So long as they're right on their initial evaluation of the uncertainty, they're going to win. You, as the entrepreneur, are in trouble because you have to get both right. You have to both have gotten the uncertainty right, and then you both have to be the one in their portfolio that actually wins. Um, I have a couple short, I, I'm not going to play the whole thing, so when you see six minutes, don't freak out. Um, but um, have you, how many of you know Steve Blank? Do you know Steve Blank? Okay, I'll, I'll keep this pretty short. Um, I'm not really big on famous entrepreneurs, but that's okay. This is. <laughs> To happen, so they will each other, uh, and either a vision or a hallucination. And the problem is, you have to believe they're one and the same. Uh, and and, and uh, you know, this hubris combined with vision and passion is what makes startups create something out of nothing. I mean, just think about it. what we do. We sit around with a napkin, and then we go, we're going to change the world. And, <laughs> and, and, and we believe it. Not only do we believe it, we're going to convince you that we're going to do that. In fact, we got to convince you we're going to do that. We're going to convince you to open your wallet and pour it out and <laughs> give us your money. And you're going to be happy even after you do that. And the odds of us actually doing that, one out of a hundred. But you'll give us your money again, and we'll do it again. <laughs> My business school students, I'd say about 10% of them, 
at the end of every semester come up to me. It's almost like opera. You say, Professor Clark, I really need some help. I need to decide where I'm going to go to work. Well, great, what are the choices? And, and they say, well, I've been offered a job at McKinsey. Well, that's spectacular. McKinsey is a world-class firm. What's your other choice? I'll come with my friends when I go do a start. And I look at them, and I still can't, even after all these years, can't get the shock off my face. And I go, well, you just decide. What do you mean? I'm asking you to help me. They say, no, no, no. You just decide. Join McKinsey. <laughs> because unless you're waking up in the middle of the night taking notes on your start, or by the time you get to your shower in the middle of the morning, you can't wait to work on your startup. Now, that's not what you're cut out for. A, a startup is an irrational passion. It is not a job. Now, normal people have jobs. Entrepreneurs are irrational. And unless you're irrational, don't think of it as a job choice. It's not a career choice. Entrepreneurship is a calling. And you shouldn't be doing it because your friends are doing it. Should be doing it because it's a it's a virus that's gotten into your head. And you needed to get it out of your system, and some of us are just stuck with it for the rest of our lives. And sometimes it pays off, but many times it doesn't. But it is not a job. All right. Um, but one more. Um. There's so much in there. Um, there's so much in there. I've actually listened to that a bunch of times. Um, I love so much of it. How do you train entrepreneurs? Right? This is especially relevant to this audience here. Um, can it be trained? Can it be taught? His distinction between the founder and the early employees, I think, is a very good one. Um, it's very clear that the early employees who are so critical to a startup success, those are trainable. Are entrepreneurs trainable? Is it worth spending time with high school students trying to make them entrepreneurs any more than it would be to try to make them like Mozart or Beethoven? Um, and I'm the last person who would compare myself to an artist. Um, if my uh, ceramics teacher from IMSA were here, he would, I promise you, assure you, uh, confirm that. Um, but you know, there's always this analogy of the starving artist, right? And, you know, I, I'm a math 
business guy. I'm like, why, are, why do these artists do that? Why don't they go get a job? Like, why do they sit there and paint? Like, who cares? It's painting and get a job. But like, it's what we do. Just instead of painting, we're starting companies. It's just as, it must be just as crazy to the other people who are just like, wait, you're going to make a what? This, why, why are you spending all your time trying to make this thing that nobody probably even wants? Probably going to fail. And you're probably not going to make any money. Oh, by the way, you're working your rear end off. So I, I, I love the analogy to artists, which is that basically um, you, this is not the best way to make money. But then I decided, you know, that's okay. Most people actually don't spend their lives trying to make as much money as possible. Um, my brother, who's an IMSA grad, um, is a professor. He's a great professor. Actually, he's not a professor yet. He's going to be a professor. Um, but he's not making the most money. He could, he, could go to, he could go to a hedge fund. My wife, also an IMSA grad, um, it's a, it's a fam you know, family thing. Um, my wife um, is spending her life trying to change, make corporations more responsible. She can make a lot more money doing almost anything else. Um, Troy, who co-founded Accelerate and Techstars with me, could go make a lot more money. But he wants to dedicate his time to helping uh, entrepreneurs be more successful. So most people, actually, it turns out, don't maximize their income. That's not necessarily a goal of, of anyone's life. And so I think entrepreneurship, you have to go into it knowing that um, the exhilaration of the journey is more valuable than, than, the, than the destination. And that, if, if you're not fully signed up for that, then I don't think entrepreneurship is for you. OK, end of phase one. Whew. <sighs> the rest actually know what I'm talking about. That I just made up. Um, OK, so um, again, usually I would sit here and I would just tell you how great my 13 years of entrepreneurship have been. and I'd, It's like this great thing. Um, but I'm going to talk. I think it'll be much more interesting to this crowd to hear some of the, the, the pitfalls. Um, a lot of this stuff I haven't really talked publicly about before, so um, if it doesn't come, across, come out just quite as um, cleanly, um, just forgive me with that. So I was born um, in Bourbonnet, Illinois, in a little uh, town with a bunch of cornfields. Now it's home to the Chicago Bears training camp, so now it's a, it's a famous place to be from. But back in the day, it was just my little school. Um, and I was the smartest kid in my class. Hands down. Um, <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. My, my modesty comes back moment, in a moment. But at the time, I was the smartest kid in the school. Um, and, you know, I was like, mostly like any other kid. I, you know, had in my, in my locker, I had a Michael Jordan and I had a poster of Ryan Sandberg. I also had a poster of um, the USA Today uh, profile in top Fortune 500 CEOs. So that was my first clue that I, in retrospect, that was weird. Uh, it turns out no one else had that particular issue of USA Today in their, in their locker. But I've always had this interest in business. Um, then I went to IMSA, uh, which is a three-year program. So it was my sophomore year. Um, I wasn't the smartest person in my, on my floor, uh, let alone my dorm or my class. Um, and I actually had a pretty unremarkable career at IMSA now that I, now that I think back on it. Um, no leadership skills, really. Um, I was the captain of the sophomore basketball team, um, which uh, I think we won a game that year. Um, and on the one hand, what I didn't tell my coach at the time was I had never in my life played organized basketball before the first game, which I was captain of the team. And at first I laughed. Um, and I was like, OK, what do I do? Like literally, like, what happens? How does the game start? I don't know. Like, do you flip a coin? Or like, I don't know. What happens? Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, it was pretty interesting that he basically said, the person I'm going to choose to be the captain of this team isn't the most talented basketball player, not even the most experienced basketball player, but someone who has leadership skills. That was interesting. Um, my other claim to fame at IMSA was that I rigged the, uh, the voting for prom theme. <laughs> Let that be said. Um, when I applied to school, I, uh, reject, it was rejected uh, almost everywhere I applied. Um, Yale, Stanford, and Penn all rejected me. Um, got into Harvard. <laughs> it's all right. Um, which I'm pretty sure actually happened on the basis exclusively of my interview. I think I had a really good interview where I was able to kind of talk about what I'd accomplished it, well, what I proposed to have accomplished at IMSA during my high school career. Um, but, but I think it was, again, it was someone who had looked beyond just the sort of the, the, what was on the paper and said, okay, well, this is someone I want to a, take a bet on which I think is, you know, was pretty prophetic. 
Um, so I went to Harvard. Um, now I wasn't even the smartest person in my room. Um, my roommate, uh, Max, is to this day still the smartest person I know. Um, and so first, first semester of, uh, of school, I took uh, CS50, which is the introductory class at Harvard, uh, introductory computer science class at Harvard. Um, and I did terribly. I um, was going to drop the class. And so I went in to see uh, the professor. And I was like, or, uh, Professor Seltzer was her name. And I was like, I don't think I should take this class. I'm not doing very well in it. Uh, can I drop it? And she was like, well, just go to the whiteboard. She started asking me questions. And it turns out that I actually understood most of the concepts. But I, just wasn't, I was having a hard time actually you know, getting the assignments done or whatever. So she was like, I want you to stay in the class. I want you to come see me every week. And by the end of this class, you're going you're gonna to do well in this class. And so sure enough, she had the confidence in me. Again, I, who was I? I was just some freshman kid in a 300-person class. But she took the time to say, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend time with you. I'm going to help you. I ended up finishing the class, um, did well. And I came in at the end of the semester to thank her. And I said, Professor Seltzer, thank you so much for your time. Um, it was really meaningful. Um, she said, well, you're going to take CS51, the next class. I said, I laughed. No, of course I'm not going to take CS51. Are you crazy? That was hell. Why would I do that to myself? <laughs> um, and she's like, uh, Sam, I want you to take CS51, and then I want, you to, I want you to apply to be a teaching assistant with me next year. It's crazy. Um, but I was like, and I remember walking home, walking back to my dorm, and I'm being like, I'm at Harvard, and a professor just told me to take a class and apply to be a teaching assistant. This is crazy. I didn't even do that well in the class. I said, OK. So I took CS51, did fine. Um, and then I went to her and I was like, do you really want me to apply to be a teaching assistant? She's like, absolutely. You should do it. So I applied, uh, got the job. And uh, as a sophomore, I was teaching freshmen, which is a whole other issue, but that's fine. Um, and I won the Derek Bach Award for Distinction in Teaching. I was one of the best teachers in all of Harvard College. For, actually, in all of Harvard University. I was, I was, I was one of the best uh, teaching assistants. And it turns out I won that award six semesters in a row. I was one of the best teachers, one of the best teaching assistants that Harvard had had. Um, but more interestingly than that, I thought, was after the second year, after my junior year, um, they had switched professors. And the professor asked me to be the head teaching, head teaching fellow of the class. So not only was I um, the best teacher, but I was also now managing these 30 other teachers. Mind you, I'm not a computer science major at this point. I had switched into math. So here I am, I'm not even, I'd only taken three computer science classes in my entire time at Harvard, and I was the head teaching fellow for not just CS50, but also for CS51, managing 40 computer scientists who were all teaching computer science to 600 students. And so now I get to my first tip. You have to be brutally self-aware to be a good entrepreneur. A lot of these tips are actually for life, but for entrepreneurs especially. You have to know your strengths and weaknesses. And I knew I was never the smartest person in the room. But I'm good at a lot of other things. I was good at teaching. I was good at organizing. I had good leadership skills. And those were all things that as I thought about how I wanted to evolve my career and what I was doing, these are all things that I had to keep in mind. OK, next. Um, I started this company called SparkNotes. Anyone here ever use SparkNotes? OK, good. All right. Good. Good. Every, once in a while, the, the, every once in a while, the IMSA folk try to tell me they don't, but that's OK. Um, I guess, you, I guess you do. So I had um, three co-founders of uh, SparkNotes. Uh, this guy Max, this guy Chris, and this guy Eli. Uh, this is our senior year of college. Um, and it turns out um, that I was really good at organizing, getting things done. I was the business guy. I was the CEO. Max, who was my roommate, aforementioned smartest guy I know, was an amazing engineer. He graduated summa at, from Harvard. He's like insanely smart. He's later got a uh, PhD from MIT. Uh, this guy, Chris, second smartest guy I know. Drives him crazy that I say that. Um, second smartest guy. He was this brilliant guy at figuring out how people use the internet and what's going to be popular. And, and it's now what you would call a product person. And there was this guy, Eli, the fourth founder. He was really, really good at smoking pot. <laughs> and it turns out that of those four skill sets, the one least useful to being an entrepreneur is smoking pot. And so. No, no, no less than two months into our being a business partners, we realized that this guy Eli had to go. So we were in a situation where we had to fire one of our co-founders, which was um, a huge distraction. 
Uh, we ended up getting in all kinds of legal battles with him later. Um, so it's one of my biggest learnings. The biggest learnings was you, who, who you start a company with is one of the most important decisions you make. On the flip side, Max and Chris are fabulous. Um, we since started OkCupid together. Um, we are great friends. We have great trust. But we're all so good at what we do that we trust and defer. So I trust Chris to make a good product decision. He'll, he'll tell me what he's thinking. He'll ask my opinion. I'll tell him my opinion. He'll say, OK, you're probably wrong. And he'll do something else. And I'll say, hey, here's, you know, we're selling the company. And he's like, all right, um, should I read the documents? Like, he's signing documents on a deal that I negotiated. But he's just like, all right, just tell me how it goes. Um, now, I asked for his input. He gave me, you know, we had lots of strategic advice in, in the process of doing that. But the idea of having someone you trust so much and respect so much um, and who's so darn good at what they do um, is so key. When you look at us, we're all three Harvard math majors. Right? So on paper, you would say, oh, you're all the same. But it turns out that we have a common base. We all look at the world the same way. But we have totally complementary skills, product, technology, and business. Um, so that, that combination has worked so well. Um, it's probably um, one of the luckiest things was that the freshman dean's office put me in a room with Max and across the hall from Chris, because that was another one of those life-changing moments. So if you're going to become an entrepreneur, the most important decision you'll make is who you start your companies with. Um, we, had sold, we had sold SparkNotes 11 months after we started the company. We sold it. This was the heyday of the internet. Um, and it was, a, it, was a nice, it was a nice transaction. Um, and the way the deal worked, they paid us some of the money up front, and we had to earn out some of the money over the following year. And about eight months into the year, the, the bubble had crashed. The bubble had burst. The economy had crashed. And the CEO of the company that bought us realized that um, if they had to make good on their payment to us, we would bankrupt their company. So he calls me into his office and he says, in seven days, I'm unplugging your servers and firing all of you. And you can sue me for the money I owe you. Um, and I was 23 at the time. I was like, oh, what do you do? I didn't know what to do then. Um, and in the process of negotiating this transaction, this settlement with him, I didn't consult a single person outside of my, outside of my, outside of my founding team. Um, and it turns out that Foolishly, I agreed to um, sell SparkNotes uh, for 10 cents on the dollar, what we had sold it for just 11 months earlier, to Barnes & Noble, where it, now, where it now resides. When I could have basically taken the company myself for even less than that. And I would have forever had this platform called SparkNotes that would be all mine. Having already made millions of dollars off of it the first time, I would then just have it to start all of my next ventures from till, as a launching pad for all of my future endeavors. Um, but I, I was scared. Because the economy was probably the worst point that I've seen it in my lifetime. Um, I had 11 employees that I probably wouldn't have been able to make payroll. I would have had to fire them, downsize. And I just didn't have in my gut the vision to be able to look ahead and say, the internet's coming back. The internet's not going anywhere. I'm supposed to be this internet visionary. But at that time when I most needed to believe that the internet was coming back, that this wasn't a fad, I didn't have it. I didn't have the fortitude or the vision or the confidence to say yes. And I chalked that up to not having mentors. Um, now, I'm a mentor to so many companies, uh, and there are so many companies who just pick up, CEOs who just pick up the phone and call me, and they're like, help. And I didn't have anyone that I could do that with. So tip for everyone, um, find mentors. There are so many of us who've been around the block, so many of us who are here, like me, spending my time, want to help you. Um, there's more mentorship now for entrepreneurs, especially here in Chicago, than there's ever been. Uh, and we can help uh, show you where the minds are in the minefield. Um, I started a company called eDonkey. Uh, this was a, basically a file sharing company. Think Napster for video. Um, and uh, I'll go through this pretty quickly just in the interest of time. But um, basically, it turns out all you have to do to be an expert is to be willing to raise your hand and talk. That's it. Um, I overnight became a media, digital media expert, even though I knew nothing about digital media. Um, I'm a dating industry expert now, which maybe I am because I've been dating, I've been in the industry for 10 years. Uh, Fox News has interviewed me as a healthcare expert. I literally don't know anything about healthcare. Um, <laughs> that's Fox News for you, I guess. Um, uh, then I started giving out dating advice, which, you know, under the guise of knowing what's happening on my website, that's fine. Then Cosmo Magazine last year asked me to give the readers, close your ears, students, sex advice. Um, and my wife reminds me that no one asked her if I was qualified to do that. <laughs> um, so my, my fourth tip is find your voice. Um, 
when I started OkCupid, okay uh, when I started SparkNotes, um, we took Cliff's Notes down in 18 months. We were, when the time we started, Cliff's Notes was everything. 18 months later, we were bigger. And um, it's too easy to say that it was because SparkNotes were better, the product was better. Um, the advantages of incumbency are so strong, right? The companies that, Cliff's Notes had so many advantages over us that in our case, we had to both be better, we had to be cheaper, we were free, and we had to be more fun. Now you would call that more social in the current parlance. Um, but I think the important thing to realize is, do you think, so let's say you had better shoes than Nike or better coffee than Starbucks. Is that enough for you to beat them? You, yes, your product needs to be better, but you need to have some other advantage or else the power of incumbency is too strong. And that's one of the things that I see with entrepreneurs too often is they come and say, but my product is better than the one that's out there. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. It's important, but that's not enough. Um, fundraising is one of those important things you have to figure out when you have a, when you have a startup. Um, and the common parlance, the common sort of when you're a first-time entrepreneur, you think I want to raise as much money as possible, as soon as possible, from the most famous people possible. Right? If I get a big name VC calling me with a big check, yeah, I don't have a product. That's fine. I'm going to take it because that's a signal that I'm going to succeed. In 2006, we'd been up for three years, and I went out to the valley to raise money for OKCupid, and we were trying to raise six million dollars. And um, I met with 25 firms, and I got five term sheets. Pretty good. And um, one of the investors was trying to convince me to take his money. And the way he tried to convince me to take his money was he said, I'm going to work so hard for your success because I haven't made my name in the valley yet, and I think that OkCupid is going to be the investment that makes me famous. I'm going to work so hard for you. Got on the plane, and I flew back to New York. And the whole time, I was like, holy crap. I've got enough problems. I got my employees. I got the fact that we're running out of money. I have to beat Match.com and eHarmony. And now I got this dude. I have to make him famous? <laughs> like, how is that? That's not in my roadmap. That's not my problem. Um, and in order for him to be famous, by the way, OK, it has to be a billion dollar company. No one gets famous for, starting, for funding a hundred million dollar company. And now all of a sudden, I had to put in my list of things to do, become a billion dollar company. Well, that means taking on a lot more risk. Right? And that means doing a lot of things for the business that probably aren't in my interest or even in the company's interest, but in his. Um, so I ended up turning down his money based on his arguments that he was going to be made famous on this investment. And um, so I went out and raised angel money, and I raised a $6 million round of angel money. And it turned out to be either the luckiest or the savviest thing we did in our history. Because after the crash of 08, what most VC firms did was what I called um, killing and stuffing. Um, which is they took half of their portfolio that was dead and they just killed it. And they took the half that they thought was any good and they poured so much money into it um, that the founders got diluted. And I, 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 had, a, I had a beer with him after uh, a Coke. I had a Coke with him after, um, after uh, we sold the company. And he was like, uh, yeah, the best thing you did was not take our money because your outcome, we returned 5x to our investors. Time to go. Um, we returned 5x to our investors, but that wouldn't have been good enough for him. Even though his average investment in 2006, the, v, the venture industry in 06, the average investment returned a negative return. Right? But they pushed for such high returns that even if they have some periods of very low returns, that's OK, so long as they're always shooting for those billion dollar outcomes. So tip six, after we raised, this, after we raised the $6 million of money, our growth slowed. We'd been growing really, really fast, and then our growth slowed. And instead of doubling down on fixing that, we got distracted. We started pursuing these other things, internationalization. We were going to be the biggest dating site in Germany. We said, oh, we have these personality quizzes. Let's start a quizzing site, which we called Hello Quizzy. Now that I have a five-year-old daughter, I appreciate the Hello Kitty pun. But um, at the time, um, it, it turned out to be just a terrible, terrible strategy for us. Um, we got distracted. We burned cash. We lost confidence in ourselves. We lost confidence from our investors. I've seen lots of CEOs fail because they're too distracted. But I've never seen any CEO fail because they were too focused. 
Having too narrow a vision is almost never the reason an entrepreneur fails. Remember, you're already tackling something so big and so broad that what you perceive to be narrow is still probably very broad. Uh, I have a friend from business school who's on her eighth year of her startup, and she's on her eighth version of that startup. She keeps getting distracted by all these cool side projects that her core business has never grown. So we get to my seventh tip, which is focus, focus, focus. If you want to search for product market fit, that's fine. That's focus. If you want to, give, if you want to stop what you're doing and pivot in a totally different direction, that's fine. That's, that's focus too. But if you're just going to sort of hang around and try things that are only slightly relevant to your business, that's not focus. By the beginning of 2010, my founders and I were ready to quit. Uh, I remember this meeting we had in our lawyer's office. Uh, I don't even think most of our employees even know this. Um, but we, we got together in, in January of 2010, and we just said, you know what? This isn't working. We're going to leave. Um, and there's this, you know, if, if, you're a, if you're a sailor, if you're into maritime tradition, you know, there's this saying, the captain goes down with the ship, right? You, it's like, it's pride, it's actually maritime law that you can't, the captain has to be the last one off the ship. And that is true in, in startups too. Um, and I think it's actually the most under-talked about, most underestimated tax of being an entrepreneur, is that you're in a job now you don't like, you quit. Maybe you give two weeks notice. You just leave. If you're a CEO of a startup, you can't do that. So we were actually trapped. For, for a year, we felt trapped at OKCupid. We couldn't leave. Um, but I think what's even more important than that is that you have to have the fortitude to quit. You have to know when it's not going to work and say, I know there's pride on the line, there's investors, there's employees. You have to look a lot of people in the eye and say, this thing that I've told you is going to be the next best thing ever. I was wrong. It didn't work. It's not cowardly. It's actually courageous to face that and say, I'm going to go, go do my next thing. Now, it turns out we were actually wrong. So we were going to quit, and it turns out our company turned out to be successful. Um, but it doesn't mean that you know, we didn't go through that process and we weren't willing to do it. I'm going to just tell you the next one, that a product is not a business. Very, people often get, um, in the same way that a product, being a better product isn't enough to beat the incumbent, just saying you have a product is not a business. Right? If somebody pitches me, a, people always start with pitching their product to me, and I always say, okay, where's the business? And you'd be surprised when many entrepreneurs are like, what do you mean? I mean business. I have this great product. Can't you, can't you tell? You're missing the point. Um, so I encourage you, when you start a, when you start a business, it's often going to be product driven, um, but you have to think about it as a business. All right, my last point before we get into the fun stuff. Um, the most common question I get these days, so I sold OKCupid two years ago. I'm now the CEO of Match, which is the company that bought us, funnily enough. Um, people often ask me, are you going to start another company? And yes, I'm planning on starting another company. Um, but as I thought about it, we sold SparkNotes 11 months after we started the company. eDonkey was about four years from start to end. This May will be my 10th year at OKCupid. Now, I'm in a new role and I'm choosing to stay longer, but from the time I started the company to the time I could have reasonably left was nine and a half years. In nine and a half years, I'm going to be 45. That's old. <laughs> Feels old to me. The average startup that sells takes eight years is the average time. So uh, I think more than anything, I'm a little bit, you would think that as I've started more companies, you'd be ready to jump back in more quickly. It's actually caused me to be a little bit more cautious and more gun shy. Um, and so I would just encourage you to think that starting a company is actually a massive commitment um, and it's not one to be taken lightly. You get a free one, have fun. <laughs> Seriously, starting, running a company, starting a company, being part of a company, being one of the first employees at a company is awesome. It's the time of my life, um, and I couldn't imagine ever having a real job again. OK, that's phase two. Now we go to observations on humanity. I promise it'll be more, it'll be more fun for me. OK, so um, quick show of hands. Uh, who spends more money on, so the, bet uh, between food and clothes, who spends more money on food? I assume, OK, and clothes? <laughs> All right, interesting. OK, so one of the cool things that we get at OKCupid okay is um, we have so imagine if you had a video camera in every bar in the country. Okay, and you could basically like, and you had a team of IMSA interns who were sitting there logging every interaction that took place and then regressing it and figuring out what, what actions drove what results. So one of the things that we know is, is, is where people spend their money. 
Um, so check this out. This is um, time lapse from the age of 18 to the age of 50. Red is food, blue is clothes. By state. So when you, when you, when, when South Dakota, South Dakota, good looking people in South Dakota, who knew? Um, so let, let's, let's look at that again. So basically, when people are young, they spend much more of their income uh, on clothes. Makes sense, right? You want to look good. And as you age, you spend relatively more on food. One of the little nuggets that we get, so maybe that's not humanity that may have been a little bold. So let's, let's deal with some more interesting, interesting topics here. Um, let's talk about race. Nothing gets a real party started like talking about race. Um, <laughs> I will try to offend all of you or none of you in, in the next few minutes. Um, so one thing that we do is um, we basically, uh, if you think about your, your online dating profile is like a biography of yourself, right? And if you pool all profiles of a certain cohort, you can kind of get this aggregated biography of what whole groups of people, how whole groups of people describe themselves. So what we did is we looked at what are the outliers Okay, what words are outliers most commonly used by race and gender? So not like the, everybody uses the, right? But what words are disproportionately representative on certain groups? So here is how white males describe themselves. Okay, fine. Here's how, um, here's how white women describe themselves. Black males. <laughs> Black females. No, no, notice the amazing reference to God and religion here. Right, The first three had none. Really fascinating. Hispanic, man, Hispanic men like to dance. I like that. Uh, so. If you look at this, there's one tip for life. If a Hispanic man tells a joke, make sure to laugh, okay? Because it's basically comedy and violent sports. <laughs> Hispanic females also like to dance. Good, that works. Okay, um, one of the, so this is actually serious. Um, we, we ask the question, um, there's this phrase, love is blind. Um, and so at OkCupid, we, um, the, way we, the way we match people up is we basically, um, we determine your compatibility based on the way you answer questions about yourself and about what you're looking for in a relationship. So what we did is we basically plotted how compatible people are of different races, uh, ethnicities, male and female, and I'm going to assume heterosexuality here only because I would have to show you more graphs. What's interesting here is regardless of ethnicity, the band of compatibility is extremely narrow. Okay, I think the lowest on here is like 56, 57, the highest is 56, the highest is like 62, 61, 62. Independ compatibility, we have found, is virtually independent of ethnicity. So, if that were true, that really held out that love was blind, you would then expect people to interact and date the same independently of race or ethnicity. What we did is we looked at, we looked at people's messaging behavior, which is the closest proxy we have to dating. What we have here is reply rates. So, when a when a female sends a message to a male of that ethnicity, this is the response rate that they get. Now remember, we just showed that compatibility was basically the same across all ethnic gender pairs. But we were able to uncover, I think for the first time, because um, it's hard to ask about things like racism in a, in a study, you can't survey somebody. Right? But these are people who are actually going out and making their own day-to-day -day dating decisions. And we found, for example, that when a black female sends a message, her response rates across the board are lower 
than non-black females, even when they message other African Americans. This is the kind of data that we have that really makes um, my, our day-to-day -day just so interesting. Now let's look at the other way around. When men send messages, <laughs> the sad news is, in general, nobody responds to men's messages. Um, but what we see here, now remember, you don't know what everyone else's response rates are. But we see here that African-American females are the most responsive across the board. We just saw that they, respond, they get the lowest response rates to their outgoing messages. They have the highest response rates to incoming messages. Again, they don't know what everyone else is doing. But you can just see some fascinating trends and analysis in our data. Let's look at a um, slightly lighter topic. Um, who do 32-year-old women send messages to on OkCupid? So where you see the, you, see, you sort of see this line. Actually, forget 32, this is by age. Um, this is just highlighted. But um, you see this line right here, right? How about men? Whoa. <laughs> women? Women? Men? Women? Men. Just confirming things you already knew. Um, we did the same thing that we did for those, for, uh, those ethnic uh, gender pairs. We did them for phones. Um, so how do iPhone users describe themselves? How about Android? And Blackberry. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, now, this is, this, is my, this is my favorite part of the presentation. On OkCupid, we ask people to rate profiles, right? So you see five stars, you look at someone, you're like, that's a three, that's a one. Kind of like we did IMSS all the time, ranked all the girls, you know, we kind of knew where everyone stood. Um, so we do this millions of times a day. People rate each other's looks. So here's how men rate women's attractiveness. Actually, kind of, kind of normal, right? It's kind of a distribution that you'd expect. So what's so interesting? Well, let's look at where men send their messages. <laughs> men send two-thirds of their messages to the most attractive one-third of women. So men are pigs, no surprise. Let's look at women. <laughs> women rate 85% of men as uglier than average. <laughs> and here's the inexplicable part, they send them messages. <laughs> what is wrong with you people? Um, this may not be appropriate for this audience. IMSA students, close your ears. Um, simply by knowing what kind of phone you have, I know how many sex partners you've had. We'll move on. Um, and now we get to the dating tips. Okay, number one, say something interesting. I can tell just by the very first word of the message that you write to another person on OkCupid what your response rate is going to be. If you say something boring, Hi, hey, hello, you are not going to get a response. If you say something interesting, even howdy or yo. It's not hard, folks. Yo, seriously, it's even fewer letters. Yeah, holla's not so good. That, that's the exception that proves the rule. OK. Um, guys, 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 guys. When you message a girl, she already knows that you think she's hot. OK? Thus, do not tell her. If you use any of these words in your message, you are not going to get a reply. If you just say nice things like, it's fascinating, you are fascinating, you are cool, that's awesome. Those are all ways to get replies. Those are all ways to get dates. <laughs> you don't need to tell her that she's hot or a cutie. OK. I'm trying to see when I'm going to get pulled off the stage. I think I have one more. <laughs> You have one more in me before I will get fired. Um, so when you, when, so I gave some men some advice a moment ago. Uh, often, I've been told, 
when women uh, go out to go out on, on the town, they just think about what, what should I wear tonight? And one question a woman might ask is, how revealing should my attire be? It's no surprise that the more revealing your attire is, the more attention you get from men, right? Everyone knows that? We have been able to quantify it. <laughs> For people who are, say, 18, you have a 24% advantage. However, the cleavage advantage grows over time. And by the time you're 32, you get a 79% increase in attention simply by wearing more revealing attire. Now, I know those of you who've been on dates recently, you know this is how every first date goes. <laughs> no, really, that's not what you're thinking, kids. No drugs. Don't do drugs. Um, but what we have found is that there are three questions that can actually predict whether you and your date are going to have long-term potential. And here they are. Do you like horror movies? If you and your date agree on this question, it can be yes or no, you're likely to be a successful match. Number two, have you ever traveled around a foreign country alone? If you both answer yes or no to that question, you're likely if you disagree, you're in trouble. Wouldn't it be fun to chuck it all and go live on a sailboat? There you go. Uh, I'm just going to skip this one. We don't need that. All right. I'm going to skip that one. All right, questions. <laughs> Hey, what's up? Couple things. First, uh, I was on the Cupid, Cupid for about two and a half years. Probably went on like forty dates, and, and you paid us one, nothing. For I know. <laughs> one great girlfriend and one future wife. So thank you very uh, much. Awesome. Yeah, so Congratulations. Appreciate that. The uh, the main gist of my question results back to this analogy you made with the artist. So uh, you know, you, you talk about how entrepreneurship is irrational and analogous to creating a work for which the value is, is unknown. And then you talk about how entrepreneurship is a long-term investment and what you may be somewhat limited to be able to talk about this currently working for Match. But I, what I would be interested to hear is where does the point come where an entrepreneur decides this work of art is worth selling? Uh, and the crude word for that, of course, is selling out. Becoming a part of the general corporate environment that, you know, for the most part is the main source of economic activity. Sure. Where does that point come for you? Um, it's kind of one of the first questions I ask an entrepreneur when they, when they come and ask me for advice is I say, what kind of company are you building? Are you building a company that you want to own and run forever? A company that you want to work for for your life? There's a company called 37 Signals here in Chicago, which is a tr great company. I'm friends with the, with the CEO. And he just said, I never want to sell. I just want to run this business for the rest of my life. Most people, uh, don't want to be in the same business for the rest of your life, and they, they, they look for that time to sell. Um, I, I have found that the points have come pretty organically, in that, in that it's kind of like, I've never had a kid go to college yet, but at some point it's like, it's just time for the kid to go to college, you know? And I think in the same way, it's like, I took, okay, we took Oka Cuba to a point, and then I think it was ready for it to be in a place that it didn't need us anymore. Right? Now, that for us was, I think, the real, the real vision, where the, real, the real reality was, and we decided to leave, mind you, even before we sold, that OKCupid okay, didn't need us anymore. And I think that's actually the ultimate, um, it's ultimately the ultimate vote of confidence that you've succeeded as entrepreneurs, when you've built something that's no longer dependent. Because early companies are always founder dependent. Like, if you leave, your company's gone. And once you build something to the point where it doesn't need you anymore, I think that's great. And then it's just an economic transaction. If somebody wants to overpay you for your business, that's a good time to sell. Um, if somebody wants to underpay you for your business, probably not a good time to sell. I don't think I have a great answer um, other than we've been doing it for nine years or seven years at the time. And the obvious home for OKCupid is Match. Right? There's no company in the world more committed to, the, to being in online dating forever than Match is. Um, and so that was an obvious place for it to be. If I may attempt to summarize, uh, some sort of combination between uh, boredom and self-sufficiency? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
Yeah, you want it? Hello? Hi. Again, a bad one. Can you talk a little bit about recovering from failure or from mistake? And what is your reaction five minutes in, ten minutes in, one month in, three months in, one year in? I mean, how do you really turn things around from that point? I think it's hard to generalize mistake. I mean, I, I make mistakes daily, and most of them I just say that's the cost of doing business is that I, I make mistakes. Um, I think the biggest thing is, look, th there are some mistakes that your whole, you, know, you jeopardize your entire company, and that's one thing. But I think for most mistakes, the question is, you, you need to be able to sort of go back and dissect what happened. Like, was that mistake avoidable? If it was avoidable, how? Because you should have seen it coming. Um, and ultimately, I think most entrepreneurs, well, we're doing a lot of pattern recognition and pattern matching. And so the question is, can you start to detect patterns in your behavior and in your, and in your you know, other, other uh, entrepreneur's behavior um, so that you can basically come up with an ability to predict future mistakes? That's the most important thing. Um, I, I'm right now facing at work a, a specific decision I have to make. And ring, sort of blaring in my mind is that I've made this I've had faced this before, and I've made the same mistake three times. Um, and I'm so tempted to make the mistake again. But like, I'm, I'm, be, I'm being ahead of it, and I'm trying to convince myself not to make that mistake again. Um, so I, I don't think that there's a generalizable answer, other than you can't beat yourself up over every mistake, because you're in this uncertain territory. right? You don't know what you don't know, and so there are going to be mistakes. Uh, and there are mistakes that you might not even have been able to know they were mistakes before you made them. Experience and a, and a tenacity to overcome them. You're just digging yourself a hole. You just have to climb out of it. Go ahead. So you talked about mentorship, how important it is at all stages of the game. Love them, use them, pay them. Especially the pay them part I was unclear about. <laughs> well, what's the, what would you say to someone who's like, yeah, sure, I want mentors. What's next? Where do you find them? What do you ask of them? Um, when is it appropriate to pay them or give them equity? And uh, just what's that structure look like for you? Um, good question. I think almost all good mentorship relationships start off very organic. Um, there's someone that you have met that you can pick up the phone or email and get advice from. Um, and when I say pay them, I, I mostly mean be willing to pay them. If someone is adding a lot of value to your business, you should say, I want you more involved and engaged. I'm not saying, you know, so the mentors out there, I'm not saying you should charge for your mentorship. I mentor dozens of companies, don't get anything for it, which is great. I just get the enjoyment of helping people. Um, but then there are some companies who say, well, wow, you're adding a real ton of value. I want to engage you more. I want to formalize this relationship. So I think, I think for the majority of mentorship, it's informal. Um, you should, I hate advisory boards. I, re I refuse to do advisory boards. I won't join one. I've never seen in my life any CEO do a good job managing an advisory board. Okay, so I, I'm very anti-advisory boards. Um, for, for, for internet startups. Um, but you need to find, you should have an army, you should have people who you call for fundraising advice. You should have people you call for, what do I do with, uh, you know, I'm having this tough HR decision, this tough, I'm not getting along with my business partner. Like you should have a whole different set of people that you can call on. Some of them could be just family friends. They don't have to be like entrepreneurs. But you should have a people that you can go to for help, because we've all been there before. I had to fire a co-founder, right? I've had to raise money. I've sold my company. I've, had, I've been sued for a billion dollars. Like I've done a lot of things that, have given me a lot of gray hair and will give you the ability to have less gray hair by picking my brain. So, I don't know if you've ever had in any of your companies, or I mean, obviously, you've done quite a few things and had a lot of success selling them, maybe with the exception of eDonkey. I don't know how you can get sued for that. But <laughs> we did get sued. One billion was the asking price. I didn't have it on me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but like, have you ever seen in your company or like a company that you're involved with, like this need, like this real place where you really want to take it to a moonshot, right? Like you talked about how like, you know, venture capital firms tend to stop firms with more money than they need, but like, have you ever seen a firm where it's really like, yes, like, you know, this really should be like a million dollar business yeah. or? I I've never, I've never had the uh, fortune of, of, of running one. Um, you can count probably on 
one or two hands the billion dollar companies that have been created in recent memory. There's just there's not a lot out there. Um, there, and if if I were lucky enough to have started one, I think I would say let's go for it. If I if I saw something that was on the trajectory, I would say go for it. Um, they are so few and far between, um, and the risk you usually have to take to get there is is usually too high. What's the difference? Between what and what? Between a, a fairly successful normal business that you know you exit for like hundred million dollars in. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Just a run of the mill hundo. It's okay. <laughs> and a billion dollar business. What's the and, difference? And, uh, yeah. Look, I, I think, I think um, to be a billion dollar business, you have to believe that your business is, like, OkCupid is great, but on the other hand, it's OkCupid. Like, it's a dating site, you know? And, like, I think we had the, I think we knew from the very beginning that this was never going to be a billion dollar business. I think to be a billion dollar business, you either have to have every person in the world using your product, more or less. Um, or you have to make a ton of money. Like selling your company for $100 million, you can, you can convince somebody with a lot of money, a company with a lot of money, to fork over $100 million bucks for a strategic premium. Right? Yeah, our company's probably only worth 50. Come on. It's $40 million among friends. Just you know, fork it over. We'll do it. We'll, we'll be good. It's a whole different level to go and say, yeah, our company's worth 50. How many of you give me a billion? <laughs> you know, it's just a whole different thing. So like, if you think about it, there's like, and now that I've been in a bigger company, like I, I can see it, um, there, there's, there's a certain level at which you can get just the, just the internal politics of a big company. Like, if you want to buy a company for 40, 50 million dollars, there's a lot of people at a company like Yahoo or at a company like Facebook, there are probably a lot of people who can get a 50 million dollar deal done. They're like, look, I manage a big part of the business, it's strategic, I need the people, fine. But if you want to go spend a billion dollars, everyone in the company is going to, you know, you're, you're basically betting your career in many ways on this success. And, um, and you've got to go look everyone else in the eye and say, yeah, I know the company doesn't make any money. I know that you know, the analysts on Wall Street are going to kill us or whatever, but I want to do it. And I think that's, it's just tough. Um, and that's why you have the Googles and the Facebook. Like, you can count them. And you, those are all companies that are like, change the world. Um, and OkCupid's not that. OkCupid is great. And we have, I think we've brought more happiness to more people than almost any other company. Uh, the number of people who've fallen in love and gotten married and had kids, and it's amazing. But it's not that. Hi, Sam. Uh, I'm Janet, and I'm founding a company called Charlie. As a first time founder, I'm often thrown in situations where there's a lot of uncertainty, and you have to learn a lot and do it at the same time. How would you sort of advise? First time founders in particular to go about the learning doing ratio where you're thinking doing. Oh. So I feel like you're constantly learning and constantly doing, but how do you sort of prioritize with keeping enough mm. sleep hours? <laughs> okay, great question. The first thought out of my mind, I almost interrupted you, was you have to have a massive, massive bias toward action. Right? So I'd rather, if I'm working with a startup, I'd rather see, I'd rather them come to me, let's say we go a month between talking. I'd rather a, a, someone come to me and say, here's the 10 things I tried in the last month, and nine of them failed, but here's the one that it's looking good, rather than saying, I did a lot of thinking in the last month. I kind of think this is going to work. And instead of testing 10, I'm not only going to test five, because I've managed to eliminate intellectually five of my, of my possibilities. I'd much rather have you, that you will have just tried 10 and, um, and failed nine times. Now, there, you have to have discretion. There are certain things that are... Very hard to unwind. A co-founder, raising capital, right? Entering into certain agree contracts or agreements that are like committing you to do something. Um, those kinds of things, you can't just peel back. You can't just say, okay, well that failed, no big deal. So you have to, I think you have to, it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, my wife has this maternal instinct, like she knows her kid is sick before he's sick, which is weird. She's like, oh yeah, he, we gotta take him to hospital. I'm like, what, he's fine. But, you know, but she like, is able to tell like, what things are worth kind of raising to the next level. And I think you have to have that sense as an entrepreneur. You have to say, okay, well, what are the questions that, I have that little feeling in my, in my gut that I should probably get help on this one. 
So it's not so much you thinking. I think there's, you should be doing or getting help. There shouldn't be a lot of you just being like, you know, intellectualizing. Yo. Yeah. <laughs> no, someone called me Mr. Yegan earlier. This is, Yo is way better. Uh, it's actually, I'm going to be pitching a business tomorrow during the power pitch competition. And my question for you was, um, how during a pitch can I pitch a business as opposed to a product, like you said? Um, that's a great question. So, now depending on the pitch, by the way, um, if any of you have seen the Accelerate pitches, the pitches are very product oriented because um, if you're pitching a large audience, it is infotainment, right? As my president, like I tried to keep my president, like I wanted to keep my point across, but I wanted to keep it light, right? I wanted to keep everyone engaged. I want people to have positive feelings about me to come talk to me later, and then I can give them the real, you know, kind of the second level pitch. So I think if, if, if you're pitching a larger audience, I would say being relatively product focused is actually a good thing. Um, I look at the world as, I think I said this, acquisition, product, and monetization. Those are the three key parts to an internet business. Now, if you have a retail business, there's other things. So what, when, a, when an entrepreneur comes to me, they always start with the product. And I want to hear at least a vision, an idea, for either acquisition or monetization. I don't need all three. But you have to have actually thought about how am I going to get people to use my product? Or how am I going to make money with my product? And if, all, if you don't have either of those figured out, it's a good sign that you're in trouble. If you have all three figured out, you're off to the races. Right? Very, very few people come to me with all three. So I would say, if I were pitching, I would first focus on the product, and then I would give clear guidance. I'd give people a, a little a, a taste of how I'm going to be able to acquire customers or users, and how I'm going to be able to generate actual economic value from them. I wouldn't do any spreadsheets. I wouldn't say, here's my like, unit, unit costs, and here's my ROI. I don't need that. I need to say, hey, here's how we're, we're going to charge people subscriptions, or we're going to use Facebook as a distribution platform. Just, because then I can either be like, oh, I believe that, and I've seen how that plays out. I know what it means to use Facebook. I know what it means to charge subscriptions. But I can at least see if I think those pieces all fit together in a way that makes sense. Okay. Um, you, you said that what you did this morning is uh, extreme progress. When I'm sorry. Can you? Okay. Uh, you said two things. One is extreme progress when you are working on a problem. Yeah. And the other is uh, you must also be almost hallucinating to really <laughs> go for it. How okay. do you uh, be rational and turn down projects or ideas saying that your, life, your time is limited? Because if it is your idea, you are, one part of you is really trying to think that is the best thing on earth, but you also have to have a rational mind and say, this is not. Here's how, here's, here's how I would think about it. And I don't know if I'm going to exactly answer your question, but. Um, when you start a business, um, to say that you have a hypothesis is giving yourself too much credit. You have guesses, usually, right? And the vision is you have a belief on how some uncertainty is going to unfold. You have a guess. And the early stages of a startup are basically validating whether you are right. And so you, you can hallucinate, you can have a vision about how this uncertainty is going to is going to play out. That's why I'm starting the company. I'm pursuing this uncertainty, this vision. And then you go and you start either talking to customers, trying to build a technology, trying to do whatever the thing is that's going to make your vision a reality. And you're going to start facing either tailwinds. Yes, this is good. I'm getting good feedback from the market. I'm getting good feedback from customers. The product's coming along well. Or you're going to start getting headwinds. And you're going to be like, oh, these things that I thought to be true for my guests to be right are actually turning out to be not, not true. The customers don't want it. The technology actually is harder to build than we thought. Whatever. So you need to be able to, you need to hallucinate on one level, but then on the other level, you need to actually be maniacally analytical and rational about the data that's coming in. Right? So we said, I said earlier, the whole point of uncertainty is that there's no data. So at the high level about like, I think, I think there should be an, a free online dating site that's based on math, that's a hallucination. But then if nobody actually wants to use my product, I'd be like, oh, maybe. The whole using math part is dumb. Maybe nobody wants dating advice from a math major. Right? Maybe what people actually want is something else. So we would have pivoted our product throughout. I wouldn't have said, you know, until, you know, until death, you know, until death do this idea part, or am I gonna focus on this one part of it? Right? But I'm in it for this to pursue this vision, but I have to be open to that changing. Question. No, two or three more. Go ahead. 
Hi, Sam. So first, I'd like to thank you for Spark Notes because I wouldn't have my philosophy degree without you. Great. Great. So You're welcome. Because I have a philosophy degree, I want to ask you about ethics and morality because that's part of what you're talking about tonight. Um, and uh, on the basis of... With I'm a math major, remember, so okay, take it well, easy on me. Still have an opinion, okay. but okay. I want to okay. ask. It, so one of the goals of entrepreneurship and starting a company is market domination, com complete control and beating competitors. And when you talked about uh, specifically Spark Notes, overtaking Cliff Notes in 18 months. Um, I was wondering, how do you feel when you know that you're crushing other companies and putting good people out of good jobs? <laughs> <laughs> well delivering good service to people. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, that, I think that's the sort of creative destruction point that, that we talked about earlier. It's like, you know, uh, when, when Henry Ford started making cars, should we have felt bad for the horse and buggy? You know, the horse and buggy industry went out of business. But like, I don't think anyone, any of us is saying if only the horse and buggy people were still around, you know, the world would be a better place. Um, so look, I mean, I think, I think there is, you have to operate fairly and I, you have to operate, you know, with good ethics and good morality. Um, but I think, or, or like, but that's like saying like, do you feel bad when like the bears beat the Packers? Because those poor Packers, like they're going to be sad when they go home. You know, like, no, I don't think so. I think like, as long as we're all pay, playing, by the, playing by the rules, then, you know, I think, I think it's okay. Maybe I'm missing something, but I, I, don't, I don't think I feel bad because I think that's, you know, Cliff's Notes put people out of business themselves. Like, that, that's the whole evolution, evolutionary dynamic. So I don't, I don't think I feel bad. Uh, I had a question about uh, how did you get your initial traffic traction to, you know, Spark Notes? And then did you funnel traffic from there to OkCupid okay, and your other businesses as well? No. Uh, and, and in fact, in the second case, the reason I wish I had bought Spark Notes back was so that I would have this platform to launch any business I wanted to millions of students, you know, in a moment's notice. Um, with SparkNotes, um, we had actually started a site called thespark.com before SparkNotes, um, and it was a, kind of a, it was a site, like, kind of like The Onion, and it was a humor site. Um, and it was from, we knew within a month of starting the company that we didn't want to be in the humor business, and so we actually pivoted from being in the humor business to being in the education business. Um, because we thought that study guides would be sort of a more timeless, you wouldn't have to refresh the content daily, you just do the Hamlet Spark Note once and it's good probably for 20 years. Um, and, and so we actually had a, a base of traffic from the spark.com that we, that we moved over to Spark Notes. Uh, but the way we got traffic on the Spark was by just creating interesting content that people shared. Hi. Hey. So um, one of the things I've, you talked about is having a balance between new ideas and focusing in on what you already have. So the way I see it, I'm sure you've had like a lot of newer ideas while you're working on like OkCupid okay, or or one of the many ideas you've worked on. But um, it seems like you've had a good balance knowing when it's right to switch between the new idea and focusing really in on what you have. So I was wondering like if you have any like specific advice towards that point. Um, it's a great question. Um, I think most importantly, uh, you need to be all in on something at any given time. And I think, the, I think the something can be either the thing you're working on or the search for something new. And I think it's when you find yourself in an uncommitted zone where you're like, I'm neither all in on what I'm doing nor am I all in on finding something else, that you can find, you can, you can go a year or more, you go long stretches of time without making progress in either one. So I don't think there's any particular rule of thumb um, that I can think of, but I think it's super important um, that you push yourself to identify which one am I doing. You need to be able to identify to yourself how am I spending my time and my money. Is it on, am I all in on my, the, the idea that I've been working on or am I all in on something new? Um, and honestly, I think more than anything, it's a gut. Like you know, you know, I think. Whatever you tell your investors, whatever you tell your mom, whatever you tell your ever other people, you know, I think we knew in 2010 that OkCupid was, in 2009, we knew OkCupid was pretty screwed. Um, but then we also saw it by, you know, mid of 2010, we we're like, oh, this thing's totally not screwed. So, um, so we knew before anyone else did what was really happening. So I think it's a gut more than anything else. Uh, Sam, do you believe there's any kind of education or training that would improve, improve one's chances of becoming a successful entrepreneur? That's a great question. Um, I, I think, I don't, I don't think I know. Um, my, my gut is that yes. 
My gut is that there are things that I have done and that other successful entrepreneurs have done um, that are teachable. Um, I think a lot of it is, you know, there are certain skills like a data orientation that I think is important. I think, you know, a technical background I think tends to be helpful. Um, I think um, studying previous entrepreneurs, I think a lot of it is pattern recognition. Uh, the reason I'm a good mentor is because I've seen a lot. I don't have, it's not that I'm the smartest guy in the room, it's just that I've seen, oh, well, here's how this other company had the same problem that you had, here's how I would avoid it. Um, but I think a lot of it is also comes down to leadership, you know, and a lot of these softer and tangible things that I think in itself are hard to teach. Um, that's a good question. I don't think I have an answer. Sam, I'd like to first uh, thank you for sharing your time with us tonight and your commitment to the Chicago community is great. Thank, thank you. You're welcome. Um, my question has to do with uh, the proliferation of business to business or service provider matched platforms. I've noticed quite a number of them developing. I'm interested in your perspective on the future developments of those platforms and where one would go to better understand how and, and why they're developing. Basically, matching algorithms for business to business activities. Um, I think the big, the, the, I, I, I'm a big believer uh, in algorithmic matching. I think the bigger challenge, and, and I'm involved, I advise a number of, uh, of these companies, especially in Chicago. The bigger challenge isn't so much the algorithmic piece or the matching piece, but it's the, it's the marketplace. It's the, it's, the, it's the acquisition of the marketplace. Um, how do you get, you know, if you're matching buyers and sellers, how do you get enough buyers to come matching supply and demand as they grow up? And do you try to ratchet it like this, or do you try to get all the buyers first and to get all the sellers? Um, so in almost every one of these cases that I can think of, the challenge is around getting the, the participants, getting the, the, the actors. The matching, I think, becomes actually much easier um, is actually the secondary problem. But what we find is that it's very, very hard for, for these companies to actually get the traction to even apply their algorithms to. Um, I don't think there's a central place to go other than a lot of us who are sort of think about marketplaces and networks hang out um, and know each other. But uh, you know, other than that, um, We have uh, just time for uh, one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. A lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> be, um, my question is getting back to the whole education issue. Do you feel that your time in college, like you know, obviously you went to business school as well, do you feel that that helped you, and especially for the entrepreneurs coming up, like seniors and juniors from IMSA, some of them, is it worth it, do you feel like, especially given how expensive college is now? I would say yes. Um, I obviously thought business school was worthwhile, and put business schools, I think, college is worth much more than business school. Um, you know, I think, what did I get out of college? I got leadership skills. I got communication skills. I got uh, confidence. I got a lot of intangibles that I think I draw on every day that I wouldn't have had had I not gone there. Oh, by the way, I met the two smartest people that I, met, that I ever met, and oh, by the way, I've started two companies with them. Um, so it's one of those things where it's like, if I hadn't gone to college, um, I, I, mean, I might have been just as successful, who knows? Like I don't think my moral reasoning class, sorry, Mr. Philosopher, I don't think moral reasoning 50 is a reason I'm here today. But I think the overall development and maturity that I gained uh, was invaluable. And now, if I had it all to do over again, I would have been a computer science major, I wouldn't have studied math. Um, and I would have been laser focused on, I wanna be able to build things. So that's the one thing that I'm not, you know, like I'm pretty good at running companies and working with people, but I'm not, a build, I'm not an engineer. Um, so I would have been laser focused on saying I want to be the best technologist I can be. And even if I go into business later, I will just know how everything works much more deeply. Um, and here's the thing. I'm old, but I'm like 20 years older. You've got 20 years before you're even as old as I am. And I've got 20 more years before, you know, at least, hopefully, of starting companies. So it's like the, you've got so much time ahead of you to start companies. And you have this one moment in time, really, to go to college. And so I don't see how you could... Because let's face it, going to college when you're 30 is just much less likely to happen. So like, if I were you, I would say, I'm going to use this moment in time, which is designed, college is designed for this time in my life. I'm going to go, I'm going to meet people, I'm going to learn a lot, and I'm going to go start companies. Like, there's no, now, if you have Facebook or Google in your head, yeah, that's different. But like, if you have 
just a hundred million dollar idea or whatever someone said. You know, what are these run of the mill ideas that you just kind of drop out of your pockets as you walk around? I probably, I probably wouldn't give up college for that. Wow. Well, thank you, Sam. Uh, and, uh, I was going to close with a, a joke. But I don't think I will. Um, in all sincerity, you made. Uh, you lived up to the great minds, and I think, frankly, uh, you made them even greater. And you have uh, certainly made all of our minds uh, greater as well. That, w that was fun. It was, we learned a lot. Great questions from the audience, and it was just really a special night in Chicago, and I thank you so very much. Thanks, Thanks so Sam. Much. Great. That was great.